conclusion of the draft convention on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is the latest effort to use international law not only to arrest the proliferation, but critically to reverse that process and denuclearize the international political arena. So it may be useful to review prior international legal efforts in order to identify the obstacles encountered in the past and those factors which might impede reaching the goals of current and future initiatives. In 1954, the General Assembly had called for a convention on nuclear disarmament, but the initiative failed to gain traction. By the early 1960s, however, the international strategic and political landscape had changed. First, the process of decolonization had accelerated, and as a result, many former colonies were independent and gradually coalescing into a majority in the assembly. These new states had not participated in the creation of the nuclear weapons age. Many felt it served neither their interests nor the goals enshrined in the charter. Second, testing in the atmosphere over the oceans, far away from the testing state's populated areas, had been a critical step in operationalizing and updating weapons. But an environmental movement was emerging as a factor in liberal democracies, and its opinion leaders were increasingly alarmed by the effects of atmospheric testing on the biosphere. Third, the two superpowers, the charter members of the nuclear club, had reached the point where atmospheric testing, until then indispensable to maintaining a reliable nuclear arsenal, was no longer deemed vital to their evolving weapons programs. An agreement prohibiting such tests now looked advantageous. If the prohibition could be made universal, prevent Johnny-come-latelys to the nuclear club from, emerging, from engaging in this indispensable phase of development and thereby maintain a nuclear power and monopoly, so much the better. The conjunction of all of these trends eventuated in 1963 in the treaty banning nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere, in outer space, and underwater. In that treaty, each signatory undertook to prohibit nuclear weapon tests in the atmosphere or anywhere else if the test de deposited radioactive debris outside of the state where the test took place. In short order, well over 100 states became parties to the treaty. There were also some significant holdouts. In the meanwhile, emboldened by what was apparently a new international policy, the General Assembly began to pass more resolutions conveying a majority consensus that all atmospheric testing should stop. Now, as many in this building will know, General Assembly resolutions, no matter how wide or passionate their support, are only recommendations. When it comes to lawmaking, treaties are the gold standard of international law. In 1970, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty, a binding instrument with a wide subscription incorporated certain policies implicit in the General Assembly resolutions and in the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty. 191 states are parties to the NPT. The preamble to the NPT declares its intention, quote, to achieve at the earliest possible date the cessation of the nuclear arms race and to undertake effective measures in the direction of nuclear disarmament. Article 1 obliges nuclear states not to spread nuclear weapons to non-nuclear states. Article 2 obliges non-nuclear states not to develop or acquire nuclear weapons. Article 6 is especially important for our discussion and I ask you to suffer me reading it to you. Article 6 says, each of the parties to the treaty 
undertakes to pursuing negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. Ladies and gentlemen, the NPT, in contrast to an assembly resolution, is binding. I said that when it comes to international lawmaking, treaties are the gold standard. The only thing close to a judgment to a treaty is a judgment of the international court confirming a rule of customary international law because custom is supposed to bind all states even without their consent. The first case concerning an aspect of the legality of nuclear weapons came to the court three years after the adoption of the MPT. Some background. France, convinced that in extremis its national security would depend on its own nuclear force de dissuasion, did not sign the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty. Like the other nuclear states, France too externalized the environmental costs of its tests by citing them in the French Sahara. With Algerian independence, France had no choice but to shift the testing ground from North Africa to the Pacific, to Moro Etal in French Polynesia. But the political context had changed, and France was discovering that the testing that the United States and the Soviet Union had conducted in the Pacific in the 1950s was increasingly being characterized as unlawful in the 1970s. Australia and New Zealand protested the tests, and when France persisted, they applied to the international court, in the words of the Australian application, to a judge and declare that the carrying out of further atmospheric nuclear weapon tests in the South Pacific Ocean is not consistent with applicable rules of international law and to order that the French Republic shall not carry out any such further tests. In other words, the court was being asked to find that the rules in the treaty were binding on states that were not parties to it. Australia and New Zealand asked the court as an interim measure to enjoin the pending tests until their lawfulness could be judicially determined. For any case, the international court's jurisdiction depends on the express consent of the states that are held before it. In this instance, French consent was debatable. Its declaration of acceptance of jurisdiction explicitly excluded matters of national defense, and its adherence to a general act from the days of the League of Nations was arguably obsolete. Nonetheless, the court at that stage of the case found expressions of French consent sufficient to enjoin France from conducting the tests in ways that might cause nuclear fallout. France ignored the injunction and tested. But before the court could turn to the merits of the case, a series of statements by the President of the Republic, the Prime Minister, and the Ambassador to the United Nations declared that France had wound up its phase of atmospheric testing and would henceforth only test underground. The court in turn held that the case had become moot. The Australian and New Zealand objective had been to universalize the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty by securing a judicial declaration that the treaty's ban on atmospheric testing extended to non-signatories because it had become customary international law. That objective failed, but the court's decision did succeed in having France accept all the obligations of the treaty, even though it remained a non-party. That was not the end of the story. In 1993, the World Health Assembly of the WHO asked the International Court for an advisory opinion on the question, quote, in view of the health and environmental effects, would the use of nuclear weapons by a state in war or other armed conflict be a breach of its obligations under international law, including the WHO Constitution? <clears throat> 
A year later, the General Assembly of the UN requested an advisory opinion on the wider question. Is the threat or use of nuclear weapons in any circumstance prohibited, permitted under international law? The court declined the WHO request on the ground that the matter was not within the WHO's competence. But it did respond to the General Assembly's question, issuing an advisory opinion in 1996 entitled Legality of the Threat or Use of Nuclear Weapons. In contrast to the seeming boldness characterizing the court's approach in atmospheric tests, the court now moved with caution and excessive formalism. A few examples will suffice. With respect to the contention that the use of a nuclear weapon would violate the human right to life, an international guarantee, the court concluded that, quote, whether a particular loss of life through the use of certain weapon in, in warfare is to be considered an arbitrary deprivation of life can only be decided by reference to the law of armed conflict, end quote. As to the law of armed conflict, the court held the proportionality principle may thus not in itself exclude the use of nuclear weapons in self-defense in all circumstances. As for the claim that the use of nuclear weapons would amount to genocide, the court opined that the decisive test was not affected of the nuclear weapon, but rather the intention of the state using the weapon. No intention to commit genocide, no genocide. With respect to treaties establishing obligations to protect the environment, the court held that, quote, the court does not consider that the treaties in question could have intended to deprive a state of the exercise of its right of self-defense under international law because of its obligations to protect the environment. Overall, the court concluded that it cannot reach a definitive conclusion as to the legality or illegality of the use of nuclear weapons by a state in an extreme circumstance of self-defense in which its very survival would be at stake. A clear defeat for the group in the United Nations General Assembly that had initiated the request for the advisory opinion. But ladies and gentlemen, if the opinion failed to achieve the objective of prohibiting under international law the use of nuclear weapons, it did confirm one of the obligations of the NPT. The preamble to the NPT declares its intention, quote, to achieve at the earliest possible date the cessation of the nuclear arms race and to undertake effective measures in the direction of nuclear disarmament. And you'll recall Article 6 that requires each of the parties to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. Referring to the MPT's Article 6, the court held unanimously that this obligation went beyond the mere obligation of conduct and was an obligation to achieve a precise result, nuclear disarmament in all its aspects by adopting a particular course of conduct, namely the pursuit of negotiations on the matters in good faith. In its conclusion to the advisory opinion, the court unanimously declared there exists an obligation to pursue in good faith and bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament in all its aspects under strict and effective international control. Evidently, at least one state paid particular attention to this unanimous holding of the court. In 2014, the Republic of the Marshall Island, which prior to its independence had been a trust territory of the United States and the site of American nuclear tests, sued the nine acknowledged nuclear states for, quote, failing to pursue in good faith and bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to a nuclear disarmament in all aspects 
both under Article 6 of the MPT and customary international law. And, quote, instead of taking actions to improve its nuclear weapon system and to maintain it for the indefinite future. Only three of the states that had been impleted had accepted the jurisdiction of the court, India, Pakistan, and the United Kingdom. As India and Pakistan are not parties to the NPT, I'll only discuss the UK case. By eight votes to eight, with the president casting the deciding vote, the court held the United Kingdom's objection to jurisdiction on the ground that there was no dispute within the meaning of the court's jurisprudence. Many of the dissenting judges dissented on this point on the ground that the formalism and was excessive in determining whether or not there was a dispute. On the larger question of the importance of the issue, Judge Robinson, who joined his dissenting colleagues on the formal point, prefaced his opinion with a personal statement. And I think it's worth dwelling on. Robinson wrote, in the period of the 20 months that I have served on this court, I have been privileged to consider the interpretation and application of five treaties, but I dare say that were I to examine another 50 treaties in the rest of my term, none would be by virtue of the existential threat to mankind posed by nuclear weapons as critically important for the work of the court and the interest of the international community as the NPT. The United Nations Charter has assigned the court a special role, giving it a particular relevance in the maintenance of international peace and security through the exercise of its judicial functions. It is regrettable that the majority did not seize the opportunity presented by this case to demonstrate the court's sensitivity to that role. Ladies and gentlemen, this brief review of the efforts in international law to prohibit the acquisition and use of nuclear weapons is, I'm afraid, not encouraging. The Security Council has the charter authority under Chapter 7 to decide this issue with binding effect, but its five permanent and veto-wielding members are all nuclear powers and show no meaningful commitment to denuclearization nor have those states yet evidenced a willingness to create and join a meaningful treaty regime. And even if there were one, the international court would have to decide on its application. The court, the single institution that could clearly prohibit under international law the acquisition, threat, and use of nuclear weapons shows that when the opportunity presents itself, as it has in the three cases I've reviewed, the court is ill disposed to act. To be sure, the institutional stakes for the court are high. As for the atmospheric tests case, France denounced its acceptance of, the, acceptance of the jurisdiction of the court for future cases. And what might be interpreted as a thinly veiled threat to do the same was made by counsel for one of the states in the Marshall Islands case in the course of oral argument. Whether out of an abundance of caution, concern for its own institutional stability, or acquiescence to the distribution of power in the international arena, efforts to engage the court's resources may prove, as it has in the past, to be quixotic. Unilateral efforts to restrain the acquisition of nuclear weapons, which I'm afraid are now a part of our zeitgeist, whether based on a doctrine of preemptive self-defense or a self-appointed custodian of international security, have not fared well. In March 2003, the United States, after withdrawing a proposed Second Security Council resolution, which could have authorized the use of military force against Iraq, invaded Iraq on, among other grounds, suspicion of the Saddam government's covert development of a nuclear arsenal. No nuclear weapons were found. 
The world continues to grapple with the consequences of that exercise of unilateral force, ostensibly to prevent a state from acquiring nuclear weapons. Those members of the international community seeking to exercise these dreadful weapons from international politics may have to seek other paths to success. I hope that the process which has produced the draft convention on the prohibition of nuclear weapons proves to be one. Thank you, President Latif.